slides. Okay. Hello. Uh, just a quick introduction. My name is Conrad Shearer. I am the infrastructure lead for the Linux team at Wind River. Uh, my day job is mostly maintaining the infrastructure, uh, 100, you know, 100 servers across three data centers. So that keeps me busy. But my current challenge is trying to improve our developer productivity. I've taken that on. And so I've had to learn some of the, uh, you know, Yacht developer but, uh, workflow, but I'm not, you know, unfortunately not a, a Yocto developer expert. I'm trying to sort of juggle both things, you know, the infrastructure knowledge and um, and the developer knowledge. So I'm always looking for, you know, people to help me understand this stuff better and try to build better tooling um, and make make people more productive. So you can contact me. There's my work email, um, and I should probably be a. I'm occasionally on IRC and other things, but I will uh, try to make an effort to be more. Uh, you know, interact with the community a bit better. So some of the things I want to talk about, uh, my third build system, which I've called Rigel, um, some of the specific workflow challenges to the Octo developer workflow compared to, you know, a more traditional software development workflow. Uh, some of the develop, uh, what I call dev builds or developer builds. Um, some of the tooling I've been able to sort of hack together and I think in a, in a good way that might be interesting to other people and also the build failure login feature that I've created that's been very useful for us and some of the directions um, that I'm going in you know, I can start my video if people really want to see me um, so so yes rewriting build systems is fun this is the third time I'm currently on my fourth one so it's sort of I get a chance to, to, to learn each time and hopefully improve things my third system was really the first two systems that were very specific to Wind River, and uh, I wanted to make something that was independent of Wind River that could be, you know, shared with the community and our customers and those sorts of things. And I really wanted it to be easy set up. So if you know, you've got three, five computers that are sort of can do builds, and you want to sort of join them together into a cluster and get it up and running quickly. And so I settled after much experimentation on Docker, Docker Swarm and Jenkins. Of course, in retrospect, Docker Swarm wasn't the best choice, but you know, three or four years ago, it was actually it looked like a, an interesting solution. And it's surprisingly easy to use in the sense that uh, you have you know four machines with Docker on it. You can join them in a swarm, download my the, the uh, repository, the Git repository that's there linked at the bottom, you know, run one script and bam, you've got Jenkins, you've got worker agents, everything all hooks up and it's ready to, to ready to go. Um, it's uh, a, certainly a huge step forward um, in sort of ease of use of distributing, uh, you know, being able to ship distributed systems. And we're using this for internal builds. Uh, I still have a production, my second build system is still doing um, most the bulk of our internal builds, but we've also set this up in AWS to do some daily builds to sort of verify that it's you know not tied to Wind River in any specific way. Right now, most of the stuff, of course, has only been tested with building Wind River Linux, but um, a lot of the basics, a lot of the base stuff um, is there and, and usable by others. Um, so one of the specific uh, challenges for, for you know, Yocto development. Um, a lot of the tooling that's out there assumes a single Git repository. You know, Wind River Linux ships with 40 plus layers. And we often sometimes, you know, we have to support the idea of a change set hitting multiple layers, which is something that none of, you know, the standard uh, software development uh, tooling assumes. And often we're also in this uh, maintainer gatekeeper a relationship where the people doing the development don't actually have right access to the Git repositories that they're making changes to that usually be as a pull request or things like that. So how do you manage that? And of course, testing, you know, you can make a change, but it can affect 20 BS, B, BSPs or it can have huge uh, implications of uh, what it can change and what might need to be tested. So, you know, selecting that repository, figuring out what to build based on what changes a very difficult problem that uh, you know that, that Yocto has where it's much simpler for most applications where it's just oh yeah we need a production build we need a bug build you know with this and that's it um, so my focus been really okay how do I can shorten the feedback loops because right now a lot of our developers they'll make a change but it will take a day a week before they get feedback about whether they broke you know a, a build that they weren't that they hadn't tested themselves or whether a runtime test failed and you know, if, if it involves coordinating with other people, of course, that also extends the feedback loops. So I'm trying to, re, you know, get the the standard development workflow. You know, I said make a pull request. I, I get some feedback from a from a PR bot, and uh, I can go from there. I'm trying to say, so my challenge was, can I replicate that with Yocto? 
So first I have to back up and talk a little bit about some of the ways that Windrow Linux is set up different from Yocto and some of the decisions we made because these are relevant. And it's not that the Windrow Linux tooling is, you know, is, is the best way, of course not. Um, it's just, uh, they, there are some of the things that we've come across that have, uh, um, have turned been helpful in this case. Now there are lots of ways to solve these problems, and everybody will have to solve these uh, problems. And so this is how we did it. So we're using uh, Git repo, and we're using a tool on top that we call the setup tool. Unfortunately, setup is a horrible name because it conflicts with everything, but that's what we've got. Um, so the setup tool. This is from. Oh, it was designed five years ago. So a lot of things have changed, and so some of the design decisions may not, you know, be relevant. But it's still it's it's lasted reasonably well. The uh, customer or user can specify which layers they want. It generates this manifest, but then Git repo. And I could try to use Git repo just to make sure that I'm clear that there's no conflict with re repo or repositories. Um, and we'll generate, keep this all in sync. So the nice thing about this that's been useful for, for the developer workflow part is that Git repo can tell you, you know, where if there have been changes, especially if there have been changes in multiple repositories. And I'll try to show some of that later. The other thing that's nice, if you're working locally and you've got some local commits and you go back and you sync, it actually will automatically rebase those uh, commits as you go. This is something that's a little trickier with uh, sub modules or subtree workflows. Um, of course, unfortunately, there are, there are always downsides. And one of them is that we are supporting a fork of Git repo that supports bare repositories. So we've been you know, trying to get that upstream, et cetera, et cetera, but there's, it's complicated. So the setup tool is very tightly uh, coupled with the layer index. And so this has been very useful because it gives our customers use for being able to discover where recipes are and layers and what things are there and also manage the dependencies of so when, when a customer says, oh yeah i need this specific recipe well it will grab the layer and all the dependencies so that's been a very useful thing the other thing the setup tool we have our own native sdk which brings in additional build tools to make the um the initial experience a little bit better um a lot of the functionality where this this uh, disc, uh Work integration with the layer index has been integrated into upstream uh, by Mark Hatley as a bit big, uh, the layer index fetch. So, so a lot of this functionality is available and, you know, we're constantly looking at how are we going to, you know, can we simplify our tool by, by reusing some of the stuff that's now upstream. But of course, that's one of those things that's hard to, that development hasn't happened yet. So, and I've done some work recently with the setup tool so that I can actually grab layers and integrate them in, even if they're not in the layer index and benefit from the management with Git repo, et cetera. So I'm experimenting with that. And that also makes um, some more uh, workflows possible. So developer builds, also known as try builds in the build bot uh, things, there's, there's many names for them, pre-commit uh, workflow, et cetera. So you imagine scenario is you've got a developer working away, they've got their Pocky, Windows or Linux, whatever, set up with a bunch of layers and they've got some local commits that we're testing out and they've done run QMU and stuff. And they're like, hmm, I wonder, um, you know, I actually, I should be testing this on the following four BSPs and I would love to be able to do a runtime test on it, but I don't have access to this stuff. So I've created a script, you know, that runs repo to checks the, to detects those local commits. It essentially re, you know, figures out where those repositories were and forks them. Same as you had a GitHub or GitLab. We're using Gitolite internally, but it's not, um, if you look at the code, you'll see that, but the, the functionality is the same. This uh, repository, know, will be forked into a place where they have right access to the local commits will be stored there. Because we're using a layer index, I actually create a containerized layer index, override the entries in the layer index. And now you have a system where, you know, you can pass this to a builder and the builder can recreate the build area as it was on the developer system. So that's the first step. Now we've got, you know, a way to, to shunt these, uh, these local commits in a nice way uh, to the builders. Now, of course, we got the build area. What do we do with it? What configurations? How many different builds? Uh, so we provide a default set of configurations right now, just sort of the QMU and a basic, you know, OEQA tests with some, you know, select packages that we know work. But we give the developer the ability to override and select specific machines, image distros, all those combinations, and. The, the, hey, this was an idea from, I think this is a different idea from Mark Hadley, also gives them an idea to be able to upload the local.conf, any local.conf. So we've had situations where you've got a set of changes, but I can create three local.confs and upload and do different builds with different uh, things to see and, and, and pull the objects out afterwards and use those for testing, et cetera. We also do, the script also does some uh, 
live feedback where it connects to Jenkins and lets you know what's currently uh, what the what the current status of the builds is, and you get an email summary at the end showing you what what failed and what didn't. So there's a link here, and these slides are uploaded, but uh, they're not the latest version. I'll, I'll be giving them, but you can go and look at the uh, code if you're curious about some of the other options that are in there. Um, so one of the perennial problems is you know the builds failed on a builder somewhere. Um, but the developer cannot reproduce them. It seems to be a problem that only you know happens under load with a certain number of cores, blah, blah, blah. So is there a way to get to the build on the machine, right? So I was experimenting with this and all the builds that I'm doing are in Docker containers. And in fact, the Docker run command contains all the state and the image contains all the state. So I would save that run command. I could on the developer machine, create a temporary SSH key pair, upload the public key to the server, add the public key into the authorized key entry. And there's this wonderful feature in, in SSH in the authorized key that you can actually specify the command to run when that key logs in. In fact, Gittlelite uses this to do its authentication. And here, as soon as everything is set up, it, the script automatically SSH is in, runs the Docker run command with all the proper parameters, drops the user directly into the uh, build space, you know, the exact workspace where the failure happened at the exact state that the failure happened. So this is, uh, this has been really useful for allowing our developers to, to track down those, those nasty um, failures that are really hard to reproduce, especially we've had, you know, anyways, we've had lots of uh, those. So um, that's been very useful. Again, the code is, the, most of the code for this, well, the code for this is all up there. Again, there's some specifics uh, that are, um, but a lot of that should be, you know, uh, usable on on any sort of um, Docker generic Docker uh, Jenkins setup. Um, so this is a fully extensible pipeline, right? So we were actually able to extend this to be able to do runtime tests afterwards. So of course we do the build objects, we upload the um, the hardware images, we do the test exports. We can oh, 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 uh, push that off and then use Lava to run it on QMU hardware, even in our, uh, our Simix uh, emulator. And when the testers saw what we were doing with the build failure, they thought, well, wouldn't it be nice for our experimentation to actually have a test failure login? So the test fails can log into the area, fiddle with the, the test cases or the configuration to Lava before triggering it. And uh, that's been helpful for, for that kind of test development or when you're working for a new entry. And that's been, uh, that's been a, a very, very useful. So we actually have, you know, we're able to do the full, you know, cycle of, of work from, you know, you got a patch on a local machine, be able to build test it, runtime test it all the way around. And, you know, it's an extensible pipeline so we can add more stages uh, in the future. Um, so essentially this is exposing the large compute cluster to developers in a, in a way that they don't have to manage it, uh, separate it out, and also in a way that they can't, you know, quote unquote, do damage. Um, again, build and test patches before the commit, give them a way to log in to actually see if there's if there are failures, if it's something that they did or caused by the thing, and then the integration with the runtime testing. Uh, I was gonna try to demo a bit of this. This is a little hard to demo. What am I doing for time? Yeah, I think we're good. So let me, I've gone a little faster. So here I wanted to show uh, sorry, can you see my terminal? It's a little hard. Let me just uh, drop out of this here. Okay, it's very quiet. Anyways, I will. It's a little bit small. Oh, okay, I can't it's too small. Okay, sorry. Is that a, a bit better? Yeah, so I have a 4K screen, so it can be hard to. to I'm not sure what. Uh, um, I'll just keep making it bigger. I just wanted to show that I here in this specific work area, I created a new test case. So I had an OEQA test case here that uh, tests the uh, Python 3 virtual M uh, thing. So uh, here's the start dev build script that I've got. In this case, I'm saying just run it on a, a specific QMU machine with this specific image just for, for speed. Um, as it goes off, it's doing the check for uh, it's authenticating. And you can imagine here it goes off to GitLab or GitHub. And here it found the local commit. So this is using repo to go through the layers that are there to, to detect. It turns out actually repo will support both several ways of doing that. Um, it has some other things that I but I was able to detect this even if they haven't uh, notified repo ahead of time. And so I'm gonna stage this and start the, start the dev builds. 
it uh, uploads the commit to a, a new branch and then commit uh, connects to Jenkins to uh, trigger the build. Of course, these builds take time. So I've done one uh, pre, uh, but you can sort of see here and it's the dev build has been created. So this is, there's a one job that will then trigger. So if you add request four or 10 builds, it will then this, this one, this first job will then trigger the other remaining builds. And now it's connecting and waiting for status. So we can go to Jenkins. Um, this is, yeah, so here, the, this is, you can, this is prefixed with the, with the, I don't know if, meh, it's probably gonna be hard to see too, huh? Anyways, um, so you can sort of see here that the build was, uh, this was triggered by me, so it actually pulled my name and it's going through the various steps. Um, I did the, the one I ran previously is, uh, was down here, I was able to look up the, go to lava and find the test results. And here we can see that the, that the, uh, Python VN test was run as part of this thing and that it passed. So just uh, that's the pieces that I can, that's the pieces that I can show of, of what we've got. Um, and, you know, there's lots of future work um, that I can do here. Um, just, I'm just gonna talk about some of the, uh, so we are, you know, I've been spending a bunch of time looking at the uh, Yocto Auto Builder helper scripts, trying to integrate them into the system, work with some co-ops, uh, Trevor as well, Trevor Gamlin, Windrow has also been looking at working with this. So we're trying to trying to find a way to merge or try to work together the scripts that I've built up, but also some of the scripts that uh, Yocto has to try to, so that we can you know work uh, with. Um, right now I'm very focused on using AWS to scale the builds. Um, there's lots, of course, the, the spot instances are, uh, a phenomenal deal if you can if you can set up the infrastructure to be able to use them properly. I'm spending a bunch of time with uh, Kubernetes and Tecton. This is my fourth my fourth time around at this. So and Kubernetes isn't very well suited to batch development, even though it supports it. Uh, it's much more focused on uh, microservices and long-lived services. So there's a lot of mismatch between the APIs that it has and the kind of things. But I'm I'm finding ways to make that work. I did some work recently with. Uh, building Yocto image um, an AMI so that you can actually boot uh, Yocto on uh, on the EC2 instances, both the Gravitons and the Intel instances that uh, the AWS support. So another level of sort of dog fooding, giving you, giving you more control. And we're, we're looking at reusing uh, Winter Linux Docker images inside of some of our internal tooling as well, to sort of help uh, dog food some of those things. So I'm working on lots of different things and um, there's, lots of you know infrastructure stuff is sort of one of those things that when it works really well it, it can really help people you know be more be more productive um but it's uh it tends not to get the uh tends not to get the focus that uh, features and other things get so if, if people are interested in uh in any of these things uh please reach out i'm happy to discuss and to share what i've got um that's all the presentation that I have at the moment. I think I've gone a little bit fast, so there's time for questions. I will stop my share.